Good morning, everybody. Um, this is Alekos Theologis, and I'll be talking on spinal tumors and reconstruction. So first to start off, the <clears throat> break uh, or think about tumors uh, in terms of whether they're extradural, and these are most commonly metastatic tumors versus primary tumors, which we'll get into, or intradural tumors, and this is within the dura. If the tumor is intradural, it can be then subclassified into being extramedullary or intramedullary. So extramedullary is outside of the spinal cord and intramedullary is inside the spinal cord. So this is a nice picture showing that between the dura and the spinal cord. Examples of these are meningiomas, schwannomas, <clears throat> ependymomas, hemangioblastomas, and dermoid tumors. And the intramedullary tumors, as shown here, are within the spinal cord's parenchyma. These are astrocytomas and ependymomas. Now, intradural tumors are um, tumors that are managed by neurosurgery, but it's important to at least have a basic uh, understanding of how they look on imaging in the event that uh, you're encount you encounter one of these. Um, these are some nice intraoperative uh, photos um, so this is an example of a schwannoma. You can see it's actually on one of the nerve, uh, nerve roots and the dura has been opened intentionally to access it. Uh, you can see that the dura is uh, held open on the top and the bottom there by um, some silk sutures. Now this is a, another picture where the dura is opened um, intentionally. And that's a spinal cord and then you have to see a knife that's actually cutting open the spinal cord to access the intramedullary, so an astrocytoma tumor. And then this is a nice example of a cervical meningioma. Again, the dura has been opened. You can see there that's between the dura and uh, uh, pressing on the spinal cord. So these are not tumors that you'll encounter uh, surgically or need to make a decision about whether the patient needs uh, or how to manage them. But the ones that you should be more aware of are the extradural tumors. And these fall into the primary uh, tumors as well as the metastatic tumors. Now, primary tumors can be benign. Um, so ABCs, hemangiomas, um, giant cell tumors, osteoblastomas, osteoosteomas, and Langerhan histiocytosis or eosinophilic granulomas. The malignant tumors are myeloma, chondrosarcs, chordomas, lymphoma, osteosarcoma, and Ewing sarcoma, just to name a few. Look at metastatic tumors. <clears throat> the most common are breast, renal, thyroid, prostate, lung, GI, and GU, which are the same for um, the appendicular skeleton. So going through the benign tumors in a little more detail. So one way you can think about <clears throat> the um, type of tumor is in a very simplistic form is whether it involves the anterior column or the posterior elements. So a tumor that involves the vertebral body or the anterior column, most commonly are hemangiomas, eosinophilic granulomas, and giant cell tumors. And then those that are isolated to the posterior elements are osteoidosteomas, chondroblastomas, chondrosarcs, and ABCs, but there is definitely overlap. So this is just a, a, a initial you know, oh, thousand foot overview of trying to get a sense of how to, um, what it may be. So <clears throat> hemangiomas, you can see here, several examples of x-rays on the upper left, an axial CT scan, and then MRIs on the bottom left and right. Uh, there, it has the uh, you know, jail bar appearance, the spiculator, the popcorn appearance on the CT. Um, and really the treatment for these is uh, non-operative. So uh, non-operative measures include arterial embolization and kyphoplasty. So it's not an operation, it's more procedures. Um, these are reserved for patients who don't have neurologic compromise. And really the goal is to reduce the size um, and it also provides quite a bit of pain relief. Now you can also um, pr perform radiation on these, um, which has helped in several of my patients. And then sclerotherapy <clears throat> has also been described. However, injecting it has a potential of it um, leaking outside of the, uh, the bone, and that can really have devastating uh, neurologic complications. So if you're gonna proceed with sclerotherapy, it definitely needs to be uh, with a lot of caution. 
aneurysmal bone cysts, so ABCs, um, very similar to the extremities. MRI shows a classic fluid-fluid levels. Um, and again, the CT scans, these have a pretty aggressive appearance. They scallop the uh, cortex. And definitely um, with these, you have to think about alternative, um, more malignant etiologies as well, such as an angiosarcoma. So again, mainly posterior elements. Um, <clears throat> you can see on the bottom, the MRI shows it's isolated to the posterior elements, but it's not 100% there. You can see on the bottom right, um, you can see it in the anterior column, and then in the upper right corner, you see it uh, across the midline. So um, other things to consider when seeing ABCs, you also want to think about hemangiomas, osteoblastomas, chondroblastomas, talked about telangiectatic osteosarcoma, angiosarcoma, and giant cell tumors. So again, um, a lot of these are treated non-operatively, uh, but there are definitely indications for operative management. Um, these can be treated with arterial embolization, <clears throat> those patients with no neurologic symptoms um, or those who have uh, no symptoms of instability. Um, you can proceed with operative management. These are patients who have uh, pain that's resistant to embolization, have uh, mechanical instability or neurologic uh, deficits. So uh, similar to the extremities, these are commonly treated with curatage. Um, however, they have a very high rate of recurrence. And so some um, more recent work has advocated for an unblock resection to minimize the chance of recurrence. So eosinophilic granulomas um, are common in kids. Uh, they're a subset of the Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Other things to think about are the hand schuler christian disease, which has a constellation of diabetes insipidus, DI, exophthalmos, uh, lytic bone lesions, as well as the multifocal, multi-system involvement of letter or SWE dis uh, disease. Um, this has a more rapidly progressive nature. And they're most commonly in kids in the thoracic spine, can have signs and systemic symptoms, which raises the concern of potentially an infection, um, but they, um, have a very uh, benign course usually. So uh, this is a very impressive x-ray. You can see a three-year-old boy starts to have some collapse of the intercolumn. It goes on to uh, in in vertebral plana. This is a great example. You can see it's completely flat. And then <clears throat> the vertebral body reconstitutes itself um, over many years. So the majority of these patients are treated non-operatively with um, really good um, improvement in pain and uh, amazingly improvement in their, um, in their uh, vertebral column structure. Their, um, for giant cell tumors, um, these are predominantly in the sacrum, um, as you can see here. <clears throat> They're more asymmetric, and we'll get into how that differs between um, these and say a chordoma, which is more midline. Um, the treatment, as you know, um, with the advent of denosumab or exgeva, um, that inhibits osteoclast differentiation, can be used to decrease the size of the tumor. And this, in combination with bisphosphonates and embolization, um, can be used to treat <clears throat> the primary treatment for these, for tumors that are in <clears throat> difficult locations to um, resect surgically as well as reconstruct surgically. Um, radiation, I think there's a debate of whether this is uh, a really good indication for it because there's a high rate of recurrence with it and a pretty high rate, 10 to 20% incidence of malignant sarcoma transformation. Surgical treatment, um, you can, similar to the extremities, can do intralesional curatage and grafting, but again, the very high rate of disease progression with incomplete excision. And then really the recommended treatment to minimize chances of recurrence is to do an unblock excision with wide margin. However, as you can see in that prior sacral lesion, doing an unblock or a sacrectomy for that has a lot of morbidity and similar to the cervical spine where the neurovascular structures and other uh, important uh, anatomical, um, important anatomy for function is um, 
is, is, is in play. And uh, again, natural immunization is a key in terms of uh, approaching these um, operatively. Osteoidosteomas and osteoblastomas. This is more disease or more common in kids. And <clears throat> classically, 20% occur in the spine uh, for osteoidosteoma. They're small, less than one centimeter. Osteoblastoma are the larger ones, 40% higher percentage in the spine. And then they're larger, the more aggressive. Um, ranges in terms of symptoms that they present with. The majority of them are some type of axial uh, pain, neck, thoracic, back, uh, or low back. And then they can have a painful scoliosis. So the majority of uh, idiopathic scoliosis is not painful. So if patients have a painful scoliosis, this is something that you want to think about. Also, if it's a lesion of the cervical spine, they could present with torticollis. Treatment for these, uh, mainly supportive care. So medical management with aspirin, anti-inflammatories. For osteoblastomas, the majority of them burn out within three to four years. So it's relatively self-limited. Um, they also can be treated with RFA, but depending on where they're located, this can be uh, dangerous to do and runs the risk of causing some neural uh, changes. And then surgery is really indicated for persistent pain uh, with non-operative management, deformity, and associated neurologic deficit. And then unblock excision has been recommended um, more for osteoblastomas, but some of it advocated for it with an osteoblastoma um, because of the high rate of occurrence with just the uh, local uh, debridement and curatage, et cetera. Um, good outcomes in terms of pain relief. If someone has persistent pain or recurrent pain, that could be that there's a residual tumor or current pain uh, or local recurrence. Again, um, osteoblastomas have a very high rate of local recurrence, 10 to 15%, where the osteoderms have a relatively lower one. And then the scoliosis does improve nearly 100% of the time, um, not 100%, but more three quarters of the time. If the scoliosis is, the duration of scoliosis is shorter um, leading up to the excision, then there's a higher chance of the scoliosis improving. If they've had long-term scoliosis from this, then the chance of it improving um, on its own are, are low. So in terms of a summary, benign tumors, um, in terms of who needs surgery, indications are usually persistent pain, progressive deformity, neurologic deficit, and pain is mainly if they have mechanical instability, if the tumor has compromised the structural support of the spine. Um, intralesional curatage is all okay, but the ones with high recurrence rates are giant cell tumors, osteoblastomas and osteoblastomas and ABCs. And you can think about doing an unblock excision for these, but you have to take into account what the associated morbidity and mortality is of those operations. And that really depends on where it's located in the spine. Um, stabilization is required if you remove a vertebral body or if you remove at least one facet joint. So this is a nice case example, pretty young girl, 13 year old. You can see that she has a very tight hamstring on the right side there. Now, when you think about tight hamstrings in kids, the first thing that comes to mind is well, she has a spondy, an ismic spondy. However, you can see here on the x-rays has a relatively normal x-ray. So no, no spondy. Um, so further looking into this, get a CT scan with thin cuts and also a PET scan, PET CT. And you see here that she has this increased um, signal, increased uptake in the superior articular process. And uh, this was a osteoblastoma. <clears throat> we did, we took out the entire facet joint because accessing that um, with just a decompression would destabilize that one side. So we decided to do a, a posterior instrumented fusion. So in terms of primary tumors, shifting gears, these are quite a bit less common, uh, but important to know. So primary tumors, uh, Ewing sarcoma, osteosarcoma, and chondrosarcoma. And then whether multiple myeloma or lymphoma fit into this um, is debatable, but they are, um, they are treated somewhat differently. So they can occur anywhere in the spine, most commonly in the sacrum. The chordomas um, are midline, and that's a 
key differentiator between the other ones, which are all off center. So you can see the chordomas on the left and the osteosarcoma uh, examples on the right. Uh, so you see that it's, it's asymmetric, it's not uh, central. And this, this holds true of the chordomas really throughout the entire spine from the cervical, the occipital cervical junction all the way down to the sacrum. In terms of survival, you can see here that the most um, is aggressive is the osteosarcoma. So a patient who presents just with an isolated tumor or osteosarcoma in the spine has a median survival of 18 months. And if they have distal metastases, it's seven months. This is in contrast to the Ewing sarc and the chondrosarc and chordoma, which have a relatively, a quite a bit higher median survival, higher median survival if they have the disease isolated to the spine. But again, uh, drops off um, to less than two years with distal mets for all those other three. You can see here the five-year and the 10-year survival, which are not bad for Ewing sarcoma and chondrosarc and cardoma, but very, very tr troubling numbers for osteosarcoma. Um, in addition to overall <clears throat> five and 10 year survival, the, um, the degree of um, local invasion is also important. So if they're locally invasive, that compromises um, the mortality and this comprises the survival. You can see here in the osteosarcoma patients, um, not so much in the other ones, but again, metastases are the major drivers of mortality. So the treatment, um, if the patient has no metastases, given the relatively good life expectancy, uh, trying to achieve an unblock resection, so removing all the tumor without any negative mark, without any positive margins is the goal. Um, if they have metastases, then you either treat them non-surgically, depending on how, um, what the status is of their tumor overall systemically, or can consider limited operation for stability or palliative, um, you know, pain control, et cetera. You always have to get, <clears throat> you have to always do a metastatic workup. You get a CT of their chest at minimum, but really it's, I would get a PET CT um, that includes a CT chest, abdomen, pelvis, and um, you have to get a biopsy to confirm. And then pre-op chemo is important, for, particularly for osteosarcoma, um, as well as Ewing's. Its utility in the other two for chondrosarcoma and um, chondrosarcoma and chordoma are limited. Post-op radiation is important for chordomas, uh, for Ewing sarcoma, and also for um, um, those are really the two major ones, but osteosarcoma you could potentially consider if there's negative or there's positive margins um, with the resection. And again, important um, to do in terms of survival, you can see here that radiation therapy um, improves survival for say osteosarcoma, not for chondrosarcoma, actually not for Ewing's either, um, but definitely surgery shows a benefit. So I just wanted to run through some basic surgical uh, resection techniques. Uh, this is pretty advanced, so not something you have to know for OIT or boards, but just to give you a framework for how we think about addressing these. So there's a surgical system, a classification called the WBB or the weinstein boriani uh, Biagiani, and it breaks up the vertebral body and the axial plane into 12 pieces, uh, so a clock face. And um, if you look at zone four through nine, if it's in just the vertebral body, this is a procedure that is done through a two-stage approach. And you do a posterior and anterior operation. So the first stage is to dress it from the posterior portion, then cut the pedicles, um, and then you remove the posterior elements. Um, that is then followed, and instrument it uh, above and below. And then you do a thoracotomy um, and then you remove the, uh, the tumor from the, the vertebral body from the front. Now, if it's a posterior only 
tumor, so if it's you know the southern hemisphere, then again this is a posterior only operation. Um, you cut the lamina on one side, the axis to pedicle on the other. You remove this on block. Um, you can also do that if it crosses the um, midline. Uh, again, cut the pedicles and move that on block. Now, if it crosses the, the equator, as you can see here, zones one through six, or if it was on the other side, seven to 12, then you also have to do a, a combined approach. Ideally, you do it from the back, cut the pedicle, then you can cut the lamina, um, you also dissect the soft tissues away from it posteriorly, then you remove piecemeal the good part, so you open the donut um, on one side, and then you go from the, the anteriorly, and then you cut uh, the rest of it out and try to remove it anteriorly. Definitely easier said than done. Um, this is another example. This ends up becoming very challenging when it's three quarters of the uh, of the uh, the circle. But you try to approach this from the back first and dissect the soft tissues around the tumor, and then remove the good piece piecemeal. That's stage one, and then go from the front, release it um, around, and then hopefully take it out from the front. Um, but you can also release it from the front and then go back again to the back. To, re to remove it. So this is an example of a patient of mine um, several years ago who had a T9 lesion. You can see here, I said on the right side, um, it's you know seven to what, nine. It may cross the midline, but at least on the, this image, but on other ones, it's an isolated vertebral body. Um, now, in addition to thinking about the axial plane in terms of where to cut the donut, you also have to think about where you're gonna cut the, the discs. So if it's just in one vertebral body, you can go disc above, disc below, but if it crosses the discs, then you have to go even a level below. So it ends up going from a one level corpectomy um, to a two level and can do three or four, depending on how far it, it spans. Um, so in terms of sacrectomies, the things I wanted to highlight for you are, you know which approach to take, um, how to stabilize it, and then think about what soft tissue coverage to um, consider. So in terms of approach, basic framework that I have is if it's located at S3 or above, then doing an anterior and posterior operations, um, anterior first to release the soft tissue in the front, um, potentially make a cut anterior osteotomies, and then go the, uh, and then go the back. Um, if it's a lesion below S3, then you can do a posterior only approach. Anterior approach, you can do it standard, um, you know, midline X lap transperitoneal, or a traditional um, retroperitoneal that you traditionally see for A lifts. Posterior approach, the mainstay is a midline incision, but say chordomas and other tumors, they can compromise a fascia in the skin sometimes, and so that does require um, removal of quite a bit of soft tissue, um, the fascia and also the skin. Um, so it may end up leaving a big soft tissue defect. In terms of stabilization, if the tumor is below S3, so if you're only going from the back, then there's no stabilization required because it's below the SI joints. If it's above S3, then you have to consider, uh, if it's compromising the SI joint, you have to consider stabilization. So this is a nice example of a patient about two to three years ago, um, you can see a midline tumor, so chordoma. Can't just assume that it's a chordoma, so it's biopsy proven, but um, it fit and it was midline. It's below S3, see here it's in S4, S5. So the plan was just a posterior resection and we removed it on block. Um, the white is a bone wax on the edges of the sacrum that we cut and deep in the wound is the back of the rectum. Um, and then stabilization, again, above S3. Uh, with the SI joints, you need to stabilize it. There's a variety of techniques you can use, but these are um, ones that are described. So in the upper left, it's called a Galveston technique, where essentially the same rod that is in the pedicle screws is put into the iliac wings. This is a technique that's on the older side. It was traditionally used for neuromuscular scoliosis. 
More traditionally, now we have the iliac bolts, which many of you have probably seen in deformity surgery. But because of such a large defect that's usually left with partial sacrectomies or complete sacrectomies, doing um, additional fixation um, into the sacrum, as well as utilizing multiple rods, uh, as you see in the bottom middle, um, is, is uh, advocated. You can also put transiliac transsacral screws also to recreate the posterior um, ring. Um, and you can add that at a femoral uh, allograft as you see on, on the right there too. Um, in addition to transiliac transsacral screws on the left, you can also have structural support that extends from the spine to the anterior pelvis as you see in the middle on the far right. Whether this provides how much additional stability it provides is questionable, um, but it's another way that you can uh, reconstruct the, the defect. So this is a patient of mine, young guy, 26 years old or so. You can see here um, in the, is an asymmetric uh, osseous um, growth in the sacrum. That's kind of the mid sacrum and get an MRI, you see has a spiculated, definitely uh, bone forming. Uh, he has some transitional anatomy, so exactly defining exactly what level this is is a little uh, complicated, but probably is an S2 slash S3. So because of that, um, we biopsied it and it was an osteosarcoma grade three. So treatment was six weeks of chemotherapy beforehand, surgery, and then six weeks of chemotherapy afterwards. So the surgery we did was an anterior and posterior operation. We did an A-lift because it helps with uh, fusion and um, he's young. So if he had a non-union, I wanted to ensure that for the best chance of preventing that from happening. Um, we had to sacrifice the right internal iliac artery. And then we did an anterior sacral oste osteotomy um, through the vestigial S12 disc. We placed a silicone sheet so that when we cut from the back, it wouldn't uh, compromise or injure risking, uh, risk injuring the uh, neurovascular structures. So this was the A-lift that we originally did. And then I won't go through the details, but essentially we did L3 to pelvic posterior instrumentation. We did a laminectomy of L5 and S1. We then cut through the left S1 and S2 foramen. Um, we exit through the right sciatic notch. Um, we tied off the fecal sac at S1 and sacrificed the right L5 and S1 nerve roots, probably because they were um, involved in the sciatic notch area. So we knew that he was going to wake up with a, a foot drop as well as a uh, gastroc weakness because of the uh, involvement of the sciatic nerve. We then on the uh, cut, because of the involvement of the sciatic uh, notch, we did an osteotomy through the lateral right of the SI joint. And then we put in iliac bolts and then we did actually did a vascularized free fibula from the S1 vertebral body to the right uh, ilium for additional stability. Um, this was the tumor coming out and uh, this was the reconstruction. So again, in the lower portion of the image, that's the posterior rectum. And then we see the um, four rod construct and um, dual iliac bolts. This was the final specimen. So it was a complete sacrectomy. There was more like a partial sacrectomy. We preserved a portion of the uh, left um, ilium. And this was the final uh, construct. You can see the bottom right uh, structural autograph um, that's connecting the S1 vertebral body to the ilium. So in terms of soft tissue coverage for these, um, if you do a total sacrectomy or a high sacrectomy, then there's a thing called a VRAM. Um, and this is where you take the rectus muscle on the anterior operation. You then sacrifice or you um, rotate it on its pedicle, vascular pedicle, which is the inferior epigastric. You then wrap it in Ioban. You put, actually put it inside the pelvis, close the anterior wall. Um, and then on a separate day, you go to the back. And then when, once you take out the sacrum, then that ioban is sitting right there. You take off the ioban, then you essentially uh, neuroplastic surgery um, uh, reconnects it or uses it as their 
rotational flap. If it's a middle sacrectomy, so below S3, then you can just do a local rotational flap. Um, so again, this is a VRAM, harvest the rectus, put it inside the belly, take it out from the back. Local flaps um, are shown here, or a free flap. This is a nice example of that uh, free flap, or the rotational flap, the VRAM, and some rotational flaps. Um, you know, you pedicled superior gluteal artery perforator flap, as you see on the right. And there's a variety of other ones, keystone flaps, et cetera. Uh, bladder and bowel function say that if, um, if both S1 nerves are compromised, then you have a 0% chance of having normal bowel and bladder function. Um, if the, the more distal you go, then the higher chance that you'll have preservation. In terms of uh, so co switching gears completely, um, now it's metastatic disease. So breast cancer, lung cancer, thyroid, renal, prostate, GI, and GU are the most common. And then I would say multiple myeloma and lymphoma are not metastases, but they have a similar treatment paradigm in terms of how I think, I, that's how I think about treating them. So I think about metastatic tumors in terms of three or how to treat them and take them to three things. One is what's the spinal stability, what's their associated neurolog neurologic symptoms and the type of tumor that they have, and then what's their prognosis. So the SIN score is a score that you'll hear a lot about. Um, it's the, the spinal instability neoplasm score. It's made up of um, six categories. You can see their location, pain, bone lesion, radiographic spinal alignment, vertebral body collapse, and then posterior lateral involvement. And you can see here scores that are, are categories that are scored higher um, are increase the risk that the spine is unstable. So a tumor that involves a junction, so the occipital cervical junction, cervical thoracic, thoracolumbar, or the lumbosacral has a higher score. If it's a rigid tumor, say in uh, say S2 to S5, or a rigid segment of the spine, like the sacrum, then you get a, have a low a lower score. Pain, this is mechanical pain. So the most important question to ask is, does your pain essentially resolve or significantly improve when you lie down? And does it get significantly worse when you stand up? If the answer to both of those questions is yes, there's a high chance that the spine is unstable. Um, bone lesion, lytic lesion gets a higher score. If there's already sublation or subluxation or translation, you get a higher score. If more of the vertebral body is involved um, and there's collapse, that not surprisingly gets a higher score. And then if both of the posterior elements are involved, so bilateral facets, that gets a higher score. So you can imagine a tumor at, C, at T1 with a lot of mechanical pain that's lytic, that has translation, is collapsed, the majority of the vertebral body is involved, and both of the posterior elements are involved, that inherently is a you know, three-column problem that has very, very high risk for a catastrophic um, situation if it's not stabilized. So really, this is getting at whether the not whether this patient needs surgery because of a neurologic problem, is this is telling you, does the patient need to have the spine stabilized, just screws and rods? Um, if they have a score that's seven to 12, that's usually what they fall into, unfortunately, then quite, the answer is maybe. If they have a score that's less than six, then it's most likely stable, but if it's greater than 13, it's definitely unstable. And I use mechanical pain as the most um, important feature, the most concerning symptom. So that's that SIN score answers the question, does the patient need screws and rods stability? Now, the second thing is, what are the patient's neurologic symptoms and what type of tumor does it have? So this is a good chart. 
where you see the relative radio sensitivity of different tumors. You can see very sensitive tumors, tumors that are very sensitive to radiation of germ cell, multiple myeloma, and lymphoma. Those that are more resistant are renal cell, non-small cell lung cancer, melanoma, and GI, and breast and prostate fall somewhere in between. Epidural spinal cord compression, ESCC, comes in different flavors, mild, moderate, and severe. So in no matter what degree of spinal cord compression there is, the patient has a germ cell tumor, multiple myeloma or lymphoma, you can start with radiation. That is if the spine is not unstable. So again, two different categories. This is getting at whether the patient needs surgery because of a neurologic problem, where stability, the SIN score was more for stability. So say the patient has a stable spine, a low SIN score, high grade spinal cord compression, and a, and a, and a multiple myeloma, it falls in the radiation treatment. Now, if a patient has a high grade epidural spinal cord compression, or even moderate, and they have a radio, quote unquote, resistant or ED intermediate tumor, and they're stable, then they require surgery for treatment of the neural compression, not so much the stability. But if you're going to resect it, then you need to stabilize it. And this is followed by post-op radiation. Um, in terms of prognosis, there are several, many scores you'll see. Karnofsky, Tomita, Tokahashi, Modified Bauer, the New England score. There's a variety of things. Um, Karnofsky is a nice, easy, relatively easy one. It's not easy to remember. Um, you don't have to memorize any of this stuff. You just look it up. Um, but essentially, it's a zero to 100. Higher scores are normal patients. Uh, lower scores are very, very ill. So around 70, that's when people start to have, a, you know, they're less independent. Um, so if you have a score of 60 requiring some help and take care of most of personal requirements, but if you're getting below 70, that's when you're definitely dependent on somebody else. I'm not going to belabor all these Tomita, um, but I just want to give you a sense of what they involve. They all really take into account what type of tumor it is, um, whether the patient had the, the number and type of metastases. So if the patient has multiple met mets that are in the viscera, clearly that's going to have a worse prognosis. And then how many bony mets do they have? Multiple ones clearly have a higher or portend, portend a worse prognosis. Tokahashi, also many categories. Again, Karnofsky score goes into, um, into it. Number of extraspinal bone mets and then METs to the major internal organs, what type of primary tumor it is, and then the neurologic symptoms. The modified Bauer, again, takes into account whether the patient has visceral METs, lung cancer, uh, what type of tumor it is, uh, solitary skeletal MET. And then this one's a little bit easier to remember. Um, so if they have no visceral METs, no lung cancer, uh, it's a primary tumor, it's breast, kidney, lymphoma, multiple myeloma, and one solitary skeletal met, then they're going to have um, essentially a, a zero score. Uh, excuse me, they're going to have a, a long, uh, the high score is going to be four. And in that case, um, you could seriously consider surgery because their median survival is long. But if the answer to all those questions are, uh, it's the opposite. So if they have visceral mets, it is lung cancer, it's not breast, kidney, lymphoma, multiple myeloma, and it's, there's multiple solitary skeletal mets, then they're gonna have a very low score and that's more palliative care. So again, in terms of prognosis summary, poor factors for prognosis are diffuse spinal mets, visceral mets, neurologic deficit, poor nutrition, lung cancer, poor baseline function, say Karnofsky score, 30, and if it's an intradural tumor. If overall, if it's less than three months of prognosis, then it's non-op management, radiation. Three to six months, you can consider operation, but it's going to be a more limited operation. You don't need to go for a home run and do an anterior reconstruction, VCR plus um, posterior. But if they have more than six months to live, then 
doing a more uh, aggressive operation is probably indicated. The use of immunotherapy these days has considerably improved the life expectancy of patients. So I think probably patients are getting more and more aggressive surgery because of that. Other things to consider um, when taking care of any of these tumors is to get a full set of labs, um, CBC, BMP, ESR, and CRP. You want to make sure it's not an infection, but that doesn't totally rule it out or rule it in. Um, LFTs, coags, and assessing nutrition with an albumin or prealbumin. Also, because they're high risk for DVTs, I like to get lower extremity ultrasounds. This is in preparation for surgery. Um, always get a central line. You can consider doing embolization to minimize the blood loss if you're doing a, a three column or a, a corpectomy. You also want to consider what approach you're doing and then how to stabilize it. So in a thoracic spine, you can access it from the front to take out the vertebral body of thoracotomy. Not as commonly performed anymore. Um, now do, you can do a main, pretty much everything from the back in the thoracic spine. In the cervical and lumbar spine, you definitely need uh, to consider doing anterior, formal anterior because you can't get around the nerve roots very well. You can't reconstruct the vertebral body with a cage because you can't put it around the nerve roots very easily. Once the vertebral body's out, you have to reconstruct it. So several different ways, you can inject cement. So PMMA, you can see there with a K wire through it, the vertebral above, above and below, you can do this from the back. Um, so you inject the cement around the spinal cord. I uh, just wanna make sure it doesn't go in this, uh, touches it because of the heat that's produced. And then reconstruction can be accomplished with multiple different types of cages. You can see in A, this is a static cage. So we put it in, has a fixed height. B, C, D, and E are expandable cages. Um, the difference between B, C, um, so B and C are what's called, a they have circular end plates. Um, so it just goes in the middle of the vertebral body. And then you can see in D and E, this is a cage that has long rectangular end plates. People advocate for using the long rectangular end plates, D and E, um, because it spans the entire end plate and the apophyseal ring is hardest um, or most robust in the posterior lateral uh, aspect. So if you can put something that goes on it, that will help prevent subsidence long-term. Um, so this is a nice lady, 36-year-old woman who has a lot of medical condition, IG nephropathy, underwent a kidney transplant and chronic immunosuppression, has a new, diagnose, new diagnosis of widely metastatic urothelial carcinoma. She's on chemotherapy and she presents with mid-thoracic back pain, um, has no change of position. Uh, it's, all, it's constant and definitely at night. So the night pain concerns you for a tumor. It's constant, no change of position. So probably it's not unstable. So these are her x-rays. Clearly they look normal. However, if someone has those symptoms, you can't just blow it off and say, oh, your x-rays are normal requires an MRI. So this was an MRI on the left, looks relatively benign. CT scan looks pretty benign. And then you have see a PET CT that shows increased signal at I think T3 and T4. Now stability, you can see here, um, going through this, she has a one for location, semi-rigid, pain. It's occasional pain that's not mechanical. So it's another one, so two points total. It's a mixed lesion, so three points. Normal alignment, so zero, so it's still three total. No collapse with greater than 50% involvement, so it's one, so that's four. And then posterior lateral involvement, zero, so a total of four, so it's a stable spine. So plan is radiation. In terms of, so not radiation yet, so you have to think, all right, she doesn't need stabilization, it's not unstable, but now does she need surgery for any neurologic reason? So this is a GI tumor, GU, so it's gonna be in the resistant category, the far right, and there's a low grade epidural spinal cord compression. So there was essentially no spinal cord compression. So treatment for that is 
stereotactic beam radiation, SBRT. Now, she presents, they're planning getting ready for radiation. She calls the clinic and says, my back pain is significantly worse. Um, and so if that happens, you have to get a new MRI. So the far left MRI is the one we saw initially, and then you get a new MRI. Now you see that there's a pathologic fracture. There's now ventral spinal cord compression. The CT is not great quality, um, but it shows that there's fracture there. So because of this, now she's un documented in state unstable because she's fractured. And now she has spinal cord compression. So if we go back here, she's in the far right category, GU tumor, and now it's moderate. So now she needs surgery, surgical decompression stabilization or the neural side, but now in addition, she needs the surgery for the instability. So two reasons to do surgery. So this we ended up doing a, uh, I think it was a one level VCR. Yeah, one level VCR, do three above, three below. Um, and she did fine. Um, this is another lady, 66 year old female, history of lung cancer, status post resection. Now this lady has back pain, worse when upright, left axilla and anterior chest wall pain. So it could be some thoracic radiculopathy. So this is a lady, see here, she has vertebral plane at one level uh, and then great, pretty significant compromise of the level below. And then MRI, you see here, pretty advanced, I would say severe ventral epidural spinal cord compression. You can see there on the axials on the bottom right, as well as on the um, sagittals. So if we go through this stability score, she has mechanical pain. Like I said, is the most concerning. So it's three points. Semi-rigid, one point, so four. It's a lytic lesion, so four plus two is six. She has de, de novo deformity, some kyphosis, so that's eight. Greater than 50% collapse, so that's eight plus three is 11. And then posterior lateral involvement, I don't recall if she had some, but let's just give her a one, and it gets her into the 12. So it's indeterminate, however, you can, it looks concerning. Um, so from a stability standpoint, she falls in the in, indeterminate category. So you could justify, yeah, it's potentially unstable. We could do surgery just to stabilize it because she's neurologically intact. But look at the neural symptom type of tumor. So she has lung cancer, so far right. And then she had high grade spinal cord compression, or you can say moderate. So again, that brings her into the surgery category. So if she's not unstable, even though she, I think she is, um, doing surgery for the ventral epidural spinal cord compression would be indicated. So we ended up doing a two level VCR, T3 and T4 VCR with an expandable cage, um, as you see here. And uh, she did well. So uh, I appreciate you guys listening. Sorry, I couldn't make it in person, but uh, feel free to contact me by phone, uh, call me or email me and uh, hopefully you'll learn something. All right, have a good day.